السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين um, Thank you guys for joining me this afternoon uh, which will be uh, the first class from hopefully uh, many classes until we are actually finished uh, this story uh, of what is called Qissatul uh, Ifq and this is the story of the slander that was made on Aisha alright and this is in preparation for preparation for uh, the first 10 days of Dhu Hijjah um, we know that the first 10 days of Dhu Hijjah Dhu Hijjah itself which is the last month on the Hijri calendar on the Islamic calendar that this is a sacred month um, this is um, the month of Hajj. It's the month that we perform Hajj. And as we know that Hajj, unfortunately, um, due to this pandemic that we're still dealing with, um, they have restricted Hajj to only those who live in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So there will not be any Hajj for, you know, outsiders. That does not, not necessarily mean that the spirit of Hajj is canceled as all as well, all right. Just because they cancel Hajj doesn't mean that the the spirit of Hajj is canceled amongst the believers. And as we know, during the first ten days of the Hijjah, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he encouraged us to fast for these first nine days, actually, because the tenth day is the day of the uh, the day of the Eid, Eid al Adha. So um, for the first nine days of the Hijjah, we are encouraged to fast. And I'm hoping, inshallah, as we arrive at that point, which will be the 22nd or 23rd of July, which is in about, you know, close to 10 days from now. So maybe a week and a half from now, we'll begin the first 10 days of the Hijjah. So I figure we will get an early start, a head start on this story, seeing as though there are, there's so much to cover. Uh, with this story. Uh, many of you guys might be familiar with this story, but I can guarantee you after we are done, after we are done, uh, inshallah ta'ala, you will have a completely different perspective on uh, this particular incident. So here again, we're talking about Qissatul Ifq, the story of the lie that was told on, or the slander of our mother, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Um, couple of things before we take this journey. Um, number one, this story, will we'll, uh, we will cover it in two parts. That will be from the narration of Aisha, عنها, which she narrated this story herself. And the narration of this story is found in Sahil Bukhari. All right. So I will be reading from Sahil Bukhari. This is my volume. This is what I will be reading from. All right. And this, of course, is the tafsir or the explanation of Sahih Bukhari, all right, by Al Hafid ibn Hajr, all right. So this is what I will be reading from, as it relates to uh, the explanation of the hadith. Uh, nonetheless, um, I'm taking from Sahih Muslim, uh, Ibn Qayyim, and many other sources. So it's not just um, Sahih Bukhari. The beauty of that for you guys who cannot, um, the beauty of that for you guys that cannot read Arabic is that, uh, number one, I'm going to translate everything into English for you. Number two, if you have Sahih Bukhari in English, if you have Sahih Bukhari in English, it is volume number six. So you can follow along the story yourself if you have Sahih Bukhari in English. All right, so there's the 10 volume, the 10 volume Sahil Bukhari, Dr. Muhsin Khan, Darul Salam, Darul, uh, Darul Salam translation. Uh, you can find it. Uh, the story or the hadith itself is found uh, on page 229 in volume 6. Volume 6, page 229, the chapter of or Kitab al Tafsir, the book of Tafsir, of commentary. All right. And as you can see, the hadith is starts here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pages long. 
As you can see, even, even in the English translation, it, the hadith itself is eight pages long. All right. It doesn't matter what volume or what uh, edition of Sahih al-Bukhari you have. Go to the chapter of Tafsir. Go to the chapter of Tafsir and the hadith number. All of the hadith numbers are consistent. Uh, even if I look in the Arabic, the hadith number in Arabic is 4,750. That's the hadith number in Arabic. If you look in the all Arabic book, the hadith number is 4,750. And then if you go to the English, you go to the English translation, you go to the English translation, it's hadith number 4,750. Hadith number 4,750, as you can see right here. So the English and the Arabic is consistent all the way through. So it doesn't matter what volume, all right? It doesn't matter what, um, what edition of Sahih al-Bukhari you have in English. All you have to do is look for the hadith number, all right? The hadith number, 4,750. That is the hadith number. So you don't have to say, well, I got this version or I got that version or I have this version. It doesn't matter what your version is. Look for the hadith number. All right. And if you would like to buy Sahih Bukhari, you can go to any, you know, any uh, Islamic bookstore. OK. So uh, are we clear with that as we go on this journey? So I want you guys, you know, to class will be when, uh, Monday, Wednesday and Friday. Inshallah, we'll try to start at 6 p.m. I had a little snafu this afternoon, so we started a little late. Nonetheless, we will try to start from here on out on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 6 p.m. Inshallah. All right? At 6 p.m. All of the classes will be streamed live on Facebook, uh, Facebook Live, as well as uh, Instagram Live. All right? So, Facebook Live and Instagram Live. You can look on my Facebook page. We are streaming it live on Facebook and we are streaming it live on Instagram. All right. So if you don't have the books, then you can just follow along, inshallah. And, you know, if you have it, uh, then alhamdulillah, it's, it's not a problem. All right. Most importantly, to have your notebook. As you know, with the uh, story of Prophet Yusuf, you know, many of us ran through many composition notebooks. Uh, unfortunately, I just went and got me a 120 page uh, notebook and I have already cleared, you know, so many pages. As you can see, my notes here um, in English and in Arabic, as you can see, these are my notes. All right. So although I'm reading it to you in Arabic. I'm reading it to you in Arabic and translating it to you in English. I also go to other places and pull information from other places. So I'm not just taking from Sahil Bukhari. It's not just coming from Sahil Bukhari. The story was narrated by many, many other scholars of Hadith. And it was also commented on by many scholars like Al-Hafid ibn Hajr, like ibn, um, ibn Arabi, as well as uh, Ibn Qayyim, and many, many, many other scholars who have commented on this story. And so I will be pulling from all of their commentaries. All right? Bismillah. All right, so let's begin this journey, inshallah ta'ala. And of course, before we get into this story, um, you have to understand the backstory. As I say all the time, life is paradoxical. Uh, you can only live it forward. You can live it forward, but you can only understand it going backwards. Life is paradoxical. That you can live it forward, but you can only understand it going backwards. Um, sister, with all due respect, there's 183 people in counting on Facebook. Please don't tell me my Facebook is not on. There's 184, and the numbers are rising every minute, on Facebook. Now, if you can't find the Facebook, then ask someone. But don't say my Facebook is not on. There's 183 people on Facebook. All right. Okay, cool. So this is the story of 
Qisatul Ifq, the story of the slander of Aisha radiallahu anha. I'm going to lead this discussion with the statement of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, who was the father of Aisha, the companion of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who was affected greatly by this situation. So I want you to listen to Abu Bakr's statement and so that you can hear the pain in his voice as we begin this journey. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he said, Wallahi, wallahi, lam yadkhul alayna musabun fil islam a'zam min hadha al-musab. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, Wallahi, I swear to God, I swear to God, I swear by Allah, لم يدخل علينا مصاب My household, my family, we have never been afflicted with a calamity. أعظم في الإسلام أعظم من هذا مصاب My household, my family, we have never been afflicted with a calamity in Islam from the moment we converted to Islam, from the moment we started following the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, we have never been afflicted with a calamity that was greater and more severe than this particular calamity. In another narration, Abu Bakr said, Wallahi mettuhimna bihada fil jahiliya fa kayfa nattahimu wa nuttahim bihi fil islam. Abu Bakr said, Wallahi, we have never been accused of anything remotely close to this before Islam in Jahiliyyah. We have never been accused of anything remotely close to this in Jahiliyyah. So how could we be accused of something so grievous, so egregious? How could we be accused of something so heinous in Islam? If we weren't known to be like this before Islam, nobody goes from, you know, being immoral, right, and debaucherous before Islam, you know, goes from being, you know, it's usually the other way around. People were immoral before Islam and then convert to Islam and then adopt the morality of Islam, right? That's usually how it goes. But no one is... You know, smart, intelligent, morally sound, you know, and then converts to Islam and then engages in immoral practices. That that doesn't usually happen. That doesn't usually happen. So Abu Bakr is saying, we were never accused of something like this before Islam. So how could we convert to Islam and go through everything that we went through and then be accused of something like this, even in Islam? And as we know, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, أَشَّدِّ النَّاسِ بَلَاءٍ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ ثُمَّ الْأَمْثَلِ فَالْأَمْثَلِ The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the most severely tested people are the prophets and messengers. When you look at trials and tribulations and and calamities and misfortunes, the greatest of those misfortunes befall the prophets and messengers. When you look throughout their history, when you look into the Quran and you look into the history and the stories of the prophets and messengers, you see men that endured so much, men that endured things that we couldn't even fathom enduring. That, that's what we see when we look into the lives of the prophets and messengers, you know, in the Quran. We see men and women, we see men that were tested to such a degree, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, you know, that uh, do you think that you will enter into paradise? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Do you think that you will enter into paradise? 
And the examples of the trials and tribulations that have afflicted the people who came before you are not going to touch you. That they were afflicted. They were tested with calamities and misfortunes. And they were shaken to their core. Until even the messenger and those who believed along with him said, When will the help of Allah come? So even the prophets and messengers, they were not impervious to the trials and tribulations and calamities and misfortunes that befall, you know, the, the, regular, the regular folk from amongst us. As a matter of fact, the prophets and messengers were severely tested. The Prophet ﷺ said the most severely tested people are the prophets and messengers. Why? Why are the prophets and messengers, why are their tests so severe? Why is their test like the standard of, you know, tests and calamities that befall human beings? Because it's based upon their level of faith. The Prophet Sallallahu mentioned in another hadith, يُبْتَلَ الرَّجُلْ عَلَى حَسْبِ دِينِهِ That a man will be tested according to the level of his faith. The level of his faith. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us in our lives according to the level of our faith. Hence the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't give us more than what we can handle. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها That Allah does not burden a soul more than it has the capacity to bear. Allah doesn't give you more than what you can handle. Why? Because your tests are commensurate with your level of faith. Right? Their level of faith. So the Prophet ﷺ said, "Yubtala a rajul ala haspidinihi that a man is tested according to the level of his faith. And kanafi dini he sulba. If there's some strength to his faith, if he's strong in his faith, then his tests will become harder and more difficult. See, many of us we profess to have great faith. Great faith in Allah, and then we're always quoting verses from the Quran when it's so convenient. We sit from a place of privilege and we say, but doesn't Allah say in the Quran this and that? Knowing damn well, we don't follow it our own selves, but we sit from a place of privilege and we'll run off ayats and hadith because we sit from a place where we can do that. We'll say things like, well, doesn't Allah say this in the Quran? Well, this is what should have been done. And we'll run off the theory. We'll run off the theory like it's nothing. But what do you do when you're in that situation? <laughs> it's easy to say what you should do, what Islam says, and what the Quran and the Sunnah says when you're not in that situation. It's very easy to do that. Because you are sitting from a place of privilege. So it's very easy for you to do that. And many Muslims do that. We sit back and we look at somebody else's trial or tribulation. We look at somebody else's misfortune. And then we sit back and we say... Oh, this person should have done this. In the Quran, it says this. Or in the Sunnah of the Prophet, it says this. This person should have done this. And this is why we got to stick to the Quran and the Sunnah. And this is why we got to stick to the scholars. And this is why we got to do this. And we will run it off because it's just theory in that moment. It's just all theory because we're sitting from a place of privilege. We are not in that situation ourselves. But the Prophet ﷺ said, "Yubtala a rajul ala hasbidinihi that a man will be tested according to the level of his faith or her faith. For in kana fi dinihi sulba, if there's some strength to their faith, they're strong in faith. then his tests will become harder and more difficult. Question: Why is it that your tests are harder and more difficult because you have more faith? Why?" Why is Allah making your test harder because you have stronger faith? Why are your tests harder if you have more faith? Question. Why is your test harder if you have more faith? Because your faith should dictate endurance. Your, your faith should dictate that you have the stamina, the spiritual stamina to endure. You understand? 
your faith that you profess to have, strong faith, it should dictate endurance, that you have the ability to endure. You understand? Not to see if your faith is real because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already knows if your faith is real. Allah already knows what your degree of your faith is, which is why he doesn't give you more than what you can handle. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you greater tests because your faith dictates that you should be able to endure it. You, you can handle it. Allah knows you can handle it. So when we look at the, and then of course the Prophet ﷺ said, in kana fi dinihi riqqa. If there's some riqqa, yani his, his faith is raqiq, is weak, flimsy, fragile. <laughs> if there's some fragility to your faith, then you tell a rajul ala hasbi dinihi, then you will be tested accordingly. If there's some weakness in your faith, then the test will be according to your level of weakness. You guys follow me? And it's very important for us to understand this because I think for many of us, we are in love with the theory of Islam. For many of us, we are in love with the theory of Islam. But the practical application is where we crumble. We crumble. You understand? How do you handle the test? If you think about it, in each and every test that Allah gives us, in each and every test that Allah gives us is two things. It is the end goal, the goal that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested you with it is either to rid you of something that you, you know, some arrogance or some vice that you're struggling with. And to move you to a higher level. Those are the two things that are in your test. That Allah is either going to test you with something because he wants good for you and there's something about you that he's trying to get rid of. Whether it is arrogance, whether it's laziness, whether it is the ability to confront, you know, your demons to confront things that, you know, you are afraid of. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you this test to allow you to get rid of whatever your vice is or to get over your vice and to move you to the next phase of your faith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, La tarakabuna tabaqan an tabaq. You are going to evolve one level after another and you will continue to evolve in your life until you, until, you know, your departure from this life and then even your departure is a transition from this life to the next life. You follow me? So it's all evolution. It's all transitional. That you are going to evolve. You are going to transition from one phase to another. Until you reach your pinnacle. Or until, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes your soul. And then you will transition from this life to the next life. So when we think about the, the reason why I'm leading with that is because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as we will see, he was tested with something that some of us probably could never imagine being tested with. All right. This incident is going to expose to us the strength and spiritual fortitude of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Who was only 14, some scholars say 15 years old when this incident happened. Did you guys know that? Aisha radiallahu ta'ala. And think back for those of you women, because this incident is largely surrounded by a woman, surrounded by, you know, this woman's ordeal, her incident. This incident involves primarily Aisha. So a lot of what we are going to focus on throughout these talks are Aisha. We're going to shift the focus to the Prophet Sallallahu at times and to Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu at times and to Safwan ibn Mu'attil at times. We're going to shift the focus to the men that were involved in this situation. But this incident largely revolves around a woman. So I want you women to think about, you know, Go back. I want you to think for a moment when you were 14, broaching 15. I want you to think back for a moment 
when you were 14 and 15 years old. And it might have been in high school because that's around the time when you're a freshman transitioning into the 10th grade, you know, and that is around the time when, you know, we start to, you know, our social circle starts to get a little bigger because we're now in high school. We're being introduced to different things, different people. And I, I want you guys to think back to when you were 14, approaching 15, because that's how old Aisha was when this happened. Aisha was only 14, approaching 15, when this incident happened. SubhanAllah. And I want you guys to think about, you know, when you were that age and having to deal with something, maybe not necessarily on this level, but, you know, of this magnitude, but something close. All right. So this incident is going to expose to us the strength and spiritual fortitude of Aisha at 14, 15 years old. It's going to expose to us. It's going to expose to us. Her humanness, we're going to see her as a human being. We usually see the prophets and messengers and we usually read these stories and these incidents and we usually over glorify and over, you know, over simplify their humanness. You understand? My job, when we cover these incidents, as with the story of Yusuf, my job or my goal is to try to humanize these individuals, to allow us to see them for the human beings that they were. We tend to over glamorize, especially in today's today's time where everything is over glamorized, commercialized and over exaggerated, oversimplified. You understand and when we do that, we miss the point. We don't get to see them as the human beings that they were. Because when you can't see the humanness of an individual, then you can't make a connection to them because you are human. You are everyday human. You are everyday human. But put a little more milk in there. Some sugar. A little bit. You are human. So if you are looking at the Sahaba, you're looking at the prophets and messengers and you're seeing them as these, you know, great people. And, you know, you're not being able to connect with them humanly. And this is why when we read hadith and ayats and things like that, we read these stories, we, we miss so much. We brush through it and we pick out the fawai, the benefits of it. But you can't right? You won't learn from the incident. And this is why many of you guys have read the story of Yusuf many times over throughout your life as a Muslim. You have read this incident, but there's so many things as you follow along with me, there's so many things that you missed. You know why you missed them? Because you were looking at Aisha, the figure. Aisha, the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. al Mu'mineen, the mother of the believers. And in doing that, you missed out on the humanness. You didn't see Aisha, the 14-year-old girl. You didn't see Aisha, the 15-year-old girl who was slandered. You didn't see Aisha, the young girl who in the midst of all of this, you know, had to pull herself together. You didn't see the Aisha that I'm going to show you, inshallah ta'ala, as we move through this story. You missed it. You missed it. Because you were looking at the, the, you know, the glamour, the over glamorization of the characters and the individuals that we read about in the Quran and the Sunnah. Humanize them. When you start to see a person as a human being, then and only then can you relate to them. Then and only then can you relate to them. When there, it's the same thing that you guys do with, you know, me and other students of knowledge. You over glamorize us. You don't see us as human beings, which is why you can, you know, in the past, you know, people will post things about you, say stuff about you. You know, well, I don't rock with him. I don't listen to him. And I don't take from him. And he's this and he's a deviant. He's a straight you, because you don't see me as a human being. You don't see me as a human being. I'm just there 
you know, as this figure who pops up on the screen every now and again and gives a lecture and you get to sit from a place of privilege and say, I don't agree with him on that. Well, I don't agree with him on that. And I don't like when he says this and I don't like when he does that. And then take a clip of what I said or take a snapshot of something that I said or and then post it somewhere else and create you know, because you don't see the human me. You don't see me as a human being. You see the over glamorization of the title Shadid Muhammad, Imam Shadid Muhammad. That, that's what you see. You don't see me as a human being. You don't see me as a father, right? You don't see me as a father who has children that I'm trying to raise, that I'm trying to be a role model for, that I'm trying to do the best that I can or my end for. You don't see that. You don't see me as a husband to multiple wives who, you know, have to face the public knowing that they're married to this guy that people are talking about, that people are, you know, slandering, that people are lying on, people are, you know, you don't see any of that. Because to you, I'm just here for, you know, you know, I'm just here for you to pick me apart. That's it. Because you haven't humanized me. How a woman can send me a DM and say, brother, you married. <laughs> What do you mean, am I married? That's the way we deal with things in Islam? For you to send me a DM, for you to send me an email and say, brother, you know, are you, I just want to know, are you married? It's like, you don't even know who I am. You don't even know who I am. I had to tell a sister this just days ago in my DM. Brother, I just need to know, are you married? I said, I'm happily married. I said, but the danger in you doing this She's like, oh, I watch your videos and, I, and while that may be great, you only see what I want you to see. How do you know who I am? You don't know who I am. You only see me on social media. You only see what I allow you to see. You don't know who I am behind closed doors. And this is exactly how women, this is how you get jammed up. And this is how men get jammed up. You understand? Because you haven't humanized me. You haven't seen, you don't see me as a human being with the same pain, with the same hurt, with the same disappointments, with the same frustrations. You don't see me as an extension of yourself. You see yourself as a human being. Because when I snap on you on social media, you're like, oh, you didn't have to say it like that. You didn't have to do it like that because your feelings are hurt. Because your feelings are hurt. And so then what you do is you do reverse psychology on me, you project on me your feelings of hurt and embarrassment and feeling disrespected. You you project that on me because I made you feel like that. But you can give a damn about how you made me feel, how your post made me feel, how your comment made me feel. You understand? Because you haven't humanized me. I'm not a human being in your eyes. I'm just here for you to make mockery of. I'm here for you to laugh at. I'm here for your entertainment. That, that's what I'm here for. I'm, I'm not a human being. I'm here for your entertainment. And that's exactly how we look at the Prophet ﷺ and his companions. They're here solely for our entertainment. We're, you're, you're, they're here solely for your entertainment. And as a result of that, you miss out on so much. You're doing your own self a disservice. Start seeing people as human beings, start seeing people as extensions of yourselves. These stories that this story that we're about to read, this happened to a real person. <laughs> this is not just some entertainment. I am not here, you know, quiet is kept. Contrary to public opinion, I am not here to entertain you. So if you log on at six o'clock on the nights that we have class and so you can have your, you know, your tea so you can laugh and joke with Shadi Muhammad because he's going to entertain you. You are wasting your time. You're not going to get much out of this. I, that I promise you. You're not going to get much out of this because I am not here to entertain you. I'm here to educate. I am here to educate. Nothing more, nothing less. So this incident exposes to us the strength and spiritual fortitude of Aisha عنها, who was only 14 years old at the time of this incident. How do we calculate that? 
as is mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari, that Aisha was 18 when the Prophet sallallahu died. This happened in the sixth year after Hijrah. So if she was 14 and the Prophet sallallahu died the 10th year, maybe into the 11th year, the first, couple of the, the first couple of months into the 11th year after Hijrah, then that means that Aisha was roughly 14, about to be 15 at the time that this incident happened. This incident is going to show us the patience of the Prophet Sallallahu and his endurance during one of the most difficult times in his life since the death of, of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. This incident right here was probably one of the most difficult times in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam since the death of Khadija. The death of Khadija that year is marked as or is known in the Islamic tradition as Am al huzn Am al huzn Am is the Arabic word for year. Huzn means grief. That that year was called the year of grief. Does anyone know what year that took place that Khadija died? What, what year did Khadija die? There were, there, was an, there were three major incidents that happened in that year. What were those three incidents? What year was it and what three incidents happened in that year? Let me see where my historians are. His uncle died, right? His uncle died, Khadija died, right? And the boycott started, but there was another incident that happened. There was another incident that happened. His uncle died. His, his uncle died, Abu Talib. His wife died, Khadija, and the boycott started. One more incident happened. And this happened in the 10th year after Revelation. The 10th year after Revelation. One more incident happened. You guys are missing out on the last incident. He got kicked out of Mecca. No. He didn't get kicked out of Mecca. He left Mecca willingly by commandment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They rejected him at Ta'if? No. Another major incident. Major, major incident. Nobody else figured this out. Come on, man. Come on. One more major incident happened. No, not Ta'if. Allah revealed an entire surah after this incident. Let me give you the night journey. Thank you. Al Isra wal Mi'raj. Al Isra wal Mi'raj. The night journey. Thank you. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take him on the night journey? What happened on the night journey? Hamza was not killed in the 10th year after Hijrah. Sorry. Hamza died in the battle of Uhud. Come on, you guys got to get, get your history right, man. Get your history up. What happened? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take him on the night journey? Isra wal Mi'raj. Why? If, right, to lift his spirits, Aisha died, his wife, for the past 25 years. This was his wife. Khadija died, excuse me. His wife, Right? For the past 25 years, this was his wife, right? His uncle who looked after him, his uncle, his wife died, Khadija. His uncle who looked after him died. Two of the most important people in his life died within that same year. Not only that, the... Kufar of Quraysh, they begin to step up their efforts in trying to put pressure 
on the Muslims to leave him and they begin boycotting him. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes him from Mecca to Jerusalem in one night. When he gets to Jerusalem, what does he do? What does he do when he gets to Jerusalem? He goes to Beit al-Maqdis. He goes to Beit al-Maqdis, the masjid that was built by Prophet Sulaiman alayhi salam. And when he walks through the gate of Beit al-Maqdis, guess who is there lining up waiting for him to leave the salat? Prophet Adam alayhi salam, Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, Prophet Musa alayhi salam. All of them are lining up for him to lead them in salat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaced what was, taken, what was taken from him. You understand? Can you imagine walking through the gates of Beit al-Maqdis? Walking through the gates of Beit al-Maqdis only to find someone saying, Salaamu alaykum Muhammad, I'm Prophet Nur. Salaamu alaykum ya Muhammad, I'm Prophet Musa. Salaamu alaykum Prophet Muhammad, my name is Prophet Idris. Assalamu alaikum Muhammad, my name is, you know, Ilyas. Assalamu alaikum Muhammad, my name is Adam. <laughs> you understand? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is mind blown. Mind blowing. He walks through the gates of Beit al-Maqdis only to find the prophets and messengers lining up in the salat. And the front of the prayer area open, waiting for him to stand in the front. Go to the front, lead us in salah. You understand? This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replacing what was taken from him. Replacing that hurt and that pain that he experienced from losing his wife and losing his uncle and being boycotted by the kuffar of Quraysh. And they were making mockery of him saying, your Lord has forsaken you. Your Lord has left you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes him from Mecca to Jerusalem. He reveals an entire surah in the Quran named after this incident as a constant reminder for him and for the rest of the believers until Yawm Al-Qiyamah of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did. Subhanalladhi asra bi'abdihi min layla min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-aqsa alladhi barakna hawla li nuriyahu min ayatina. Subhanallah al-azim. Subhanalladhi asra bi'abdihi laylan. Glory be to Allah who has taken his servant. Al-isra is to go from Mecca to Jerusalem. Asra bi'abdihi laylan. In one night. Min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-aqsa. Alladhi barakna hawlahu. Li nuriyahu min ayatina. So that we can show him our signs. That you are still great even though you suffered a loss. This is Surah to Isra, Surah number 17, the first ayah in the Surah. SubhanAllah. So although down, he lost his wife, he lost his uncle, the two greatest supporters that he had, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaced all of that by letting him lead the prophets and messengers in Salat, letting him know. That what you have experienced is part of your mission. <laughs> it's part of your mission. Subhanallah. So for every loss that we take in our lives, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always re, you know, balances that loss. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always balances that loss. Every loss that you have taken in your life, I guarantee you. Every loss that you have ever taken in your life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has balanced that loss with something just as great, if not greater. So, this incident that he experienced with Aisha, it shows us the patience of the Prophet Sallallahu It shows us the endurance of the Prophet Sallallahu during one of the most difficult times in his life since the death of Khadija, which was known as Aam al Huzn, the year of grief. This incident will also expose to us the plots and behaviors of those who are envious, jealous and envious, and how their actions are perilous to any healthy Islamic community. And we have 
And I'm not calling anybody a hypocrite. But when you look at the behavior of these individuals and what they did to the community of the Prophet wasallam, you will be able to look out into our community and you will be able to spot the same behavior. I promise you. I promise you. And to answer your question, no, the balance is not always in the dunya. Sometimes Allah balances your loss with giving you an increase in spirituality, giving you that burst of the burst of spiritual energy. It's not always going to be supplementing your loss in the dunya with something from the dunya. Sometimes Allah supplements your loss with, you know, what is greater. Obviously, spirituality would be greater. Anything spiritual would be greater. Anything spiritual would be greater. As the Prophet وسلم, he saw one of his companions, Rabi'ah, and he said to him, Ya Rabi'ah, sell me u'tik. Ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. Anything you want. Pick whatever you want and I'll give it to you. I'll ask Allah to give it to you. And Rabi'ah said, all I want is your marafaqa. All I want is to be is your companion in paradise. The Prophet وسلم, was staghrab. Prophet وسلم, was amazed. He said, don't you want anything else? Like you don't want anything from this dunya? That's all you want is to be my companion in paradise? Yeah, that's it. The, the supplement doesn't always have to be material or worldly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes supplements our loss with, with paradise. <laughs> sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala supplements our loss with paradise, an increase in iman, and a, a burst of energy to do more righteous deeds. It doesn't always have to be worldly. But this incident will also expose to us the plots and the behaviors of those who were envious and how their actions are perilous to, um, to any healthy Islamic community. So let's take a look at the backstory so that we can understand all of the dots that connect this entire incident. Let's take a look at the backstory before we go forward. We got to go backwards. We have to go back and understand all of the dots that connect that led up to this particular incident. All right. All right. So here we go. This incident, when I refer to this incident, I'm talking about the slander of Aisha and the whole ordeal surrounding that that particular incident. This incident happened after the battle of what's called Bani Mustalik or the battle of Muraysiyah. All right. The battle of why it was called two names that they refer to scholars refer to this battle as the battle of Muraysiyah, which was a well that was located on a path on the way to Mecca in between Mecca and Medina, which was where the tribe of Khuza'a, where they resided at, or Beni Mustalak, where they resided at. All right. So in some books, you'll find historians, Islamic historians referred, referring to it as the Battle of Muraysir. And the reason why they call it the Battle of Muraysir is because Muraysir was a well, a well-known well that belonged to Beni Mustalak. And then some scholars refer to it as the Battle of Beni Mustalik. Mustalik was a tribe of the Arabs. They were Arabs. Um, uh, they also helped Quraysh during the Battle of Uhud. These particular Arabs, they were not fond of the Prophet ﷺ and the believers. They were not fond of him. And they were actually helping Quraysh during the Battle of Uhud. And so when the... Quraysh took the loss at the Battle of Uhud. Uh, Bani Mustalik, you know, they kind of felt some type of way about, they felt some type of way about that. And so this incident with Aisha happened after the Battle of Bani Mustalik when the believers were leaving that area on their way back to Medina. And some scholars say that this happened in the fifth year after Hijra in the month of Sha'ban. Now, Doing some research is kind of, you know, what I mean, it's kind of hard to believe that this happened in the fifth year uh, after Hijrah in the month of Sha'ban because in that same year there was another major battle that took place, and that was the Battle of Ahzab, the Battle of the Confederates, 
the Battle of Khandak, when they drug, dug a ditch around the whole of Medina based upon the advice of Salman and Fadisi, right? And that happened only a few months before or a few months after. So some scholars say that this happened um, in the month of Sha'ban, which is the month right before Ramadan, which means that because this battle lasted about, you know, lasted roughly about three weeks to a month. And that means that it would have taken them all the way into Ramadan. All right. And, you know, the battle of Ahzab happened right after that. All right. Um, other scholars like Ibn Hajar, uh, Ibn Qayyim, and many other uh, scholars like the historian Ibn Ishaq and others, they say that this battle happened in the sixth year after Hijrah. And that, that seems to, that sits a little, a little better with me. All right. Because if we said that it happened in the fifth year, then that means it was two months uh, after the Battle of Khandak. Which happened in the month of, uh, excuse me, the, the, the Battle of Muraysiyah happened in the month of Sha'ban. And the Battle of Khandak, they say, happened in the month of Shawwal, which was the month right after Ramadan. So that means that they went to war twice within a span of three months. Not necessarily hard to fathom or hard to accept, but it just seems like, you know, and I feel more comfortable knowing that al hafid ibn Hajar, as well as Ibn Ishaq, as well as Ibn Qayyim, many others said that this battle happened in the sixth year after Hijrah. All right. Hadith Ibn, uh, Ab Ibn Abi Al-Dirar. Remember that name because that name is going to be very important. All right. Because one of the Prophet's wives, her name was Juwadiyah bintu Hadith Ibn Abi Dirar. So that means that Juwadia was who? Who was Juwadia? Who was she in relation to this individual that I just mentioned? Hadith ibn Abi al dirar He was the chief of Bani Mustalik. He was the chief of Bani Mustalik. So that would make Juwadia who? To Hadith, his daughter. Right. Juwadia, no, not his sister, his daughter. Juwadia was the daughter of Hadith ibn Abi Dirar, who was the leader, the tribe, the chief of Bani Mustalib, who was the person that the believers were going to war with. It was his daughter, yes. So it shows you that Juwadia was not, you know, like some small figure. She was the daughter of the head of Bani Mustalib. Who the Prophet Sallallahu and the believers were actually going to war with. All right. So Hadith ibn Abi Dirar, uh, who was the chief of Bani Mustalik, along with many of the Arab tribes, united to fight the Muslims. The Prophet Sallallahu sent one of his companions, Buraida ibn Husayb, uh, to confirm that they were actually making preparations to fight. So the Prophet Sallallahu took 700 fighters while leaving Zayd ibn Haritha in charge of the Muslims in Medina. All right. And as they go out, 700, the Prophet ﷺ takes 700 with him to go towards uh, Bani Mustalik, a place called Qadid, all right, which was in, in, a, in the valley, which is in between Medina and Mecca. From amongst those 700 that went out, there was a large group of the Munafiqun, the hypocrites in Medina. These were individuals, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them in the Qur'an, in Surah Al-Baqarah. At the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, in Surah number 2 in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a very clear description of the hypocrites. In addition to the fact that there was a whole entire surah in the Qur'an, Surah number 63, called Surah Al-Munafiqun, that was revealed about them. All right, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposing all of their behaviors. And that surah was actually revealed... Around the time of this incident, that whole surah, I'm giving you some backstory, that whole surah was revealed around the time of this incident, exposing to the Prophet Sallallahu and the believers the behaviors and characteristics of those who were hypocrites. But Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala describes the hypocrites in the Quran by saying, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ آمَنَّ بِاللَّهِ وَبِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ Hypocrites, 
All right. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, from amongst mankind are those who say they believe in Allah in the last day. But they are not believers. This is not the nifaq, al-amali. This is not the type of hypocrisy where a person says one thing and does another. This is the hypocrisy, nifaq al-i'tiqadi. This is the nifaq, the hypocrisy of belief that the person outwardly professes to believe in Allah in the last day and adhere to Islam. But behind that claim, there's absolutely nothing there to substantiate it or support it. The person actually really doesn't believe. And please make no mistake about it. There are individuals from amongst us, men and women from amongst us today in our communities who fit this description. There are individuals without a doubt who fit this description, who say they believe in Allah, believe in the last day. But outside of the community of the Muslims, there's nothing Muslim about them whatsoever. Nothing they spend much of their time trying to dismantle, trying to dismantle the Muslim community. They spend much of their time. Most of their time is dedicated to disparaging Muslim speakers, spends much of their time trying to dismantle the Muslim community brick by brick. We still call them Muslims. We still engage them as Muslims. We still talk to them as if they're Muslims. But behind all of that facade, they are not believers. There's individuals from amongst us who pushed, who come into the Muslim community and push their agenda on the Muslims, whether it is to try to get them to accept the LGBT movement, whether it is to try to get them to, you know, stop being more conservative, be less conservative and be more politically involved and to be more liberal. Yeah, there are Muslims in the Muslim community who are hell bent on trying to pull the Muslims away from being 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 more conservative to being less conservative and being more <laughs> and being more liberal. Pulling them away from their religion. You guys keep thinking that everybody who says that they're Muslim and they have a beard and they say they believe in Allah in the last day or they profess to be this and profess to be that. Man, some of these people are agent provocateurs. That's a fact. You don't know where these people come from. They come out of nowhere, out of nowhere and Overnight, because they know in the Muslim community, all you have to be is of a certain hue, to be from a certain culture, to speak a certain language, and you will become popular overnight. Popular. Because the things that are supposed to make people not necessarily popular, but supposed to give you some level of status in our religion is knowledge, is ilm, knowledge, and action. That is what's supposed to. That's what made scholars famous. Not necessarily by how they look, but by what they put down for the Muslim community. Evidenced by the fact that Imam Ahmed and many of the scholars, Sufyan Athodi, many of them, people who didn't even know what they looked like. There's a narration of Imam Ahmed. He went to a particular place. He went into the wudu station to make wudu. And the person that's making wudu next to him is splashing water all over him or whatever. And Imam Ahmed is with another scholar. I think it was Ishaq bin Rahawai. Ishaq and Imam Ahmed come out of the, the bathroom stall where, the, where they're making wudu and they start laughing at each other. And, and Ishaq turns to Ahmed and says, isn't, it, isn't this the way that it's supposed to be? Where we can go places where nobody even knows who we are. Here's Imam Ahmed and Ishaq ibn Rahawai, these two of the greatest scholars of hadith. Imam Ahmed was given the title of Imam Ahlul Sunnah during his time. Yet he's coming in the wudu station, people splashing water all over him because nobody even knows who he was. Because they weren't known by their faces. They were known by their books. You understand? They were known by the information that they left behind for the ummah to benefit from. Today, we know you by your, your Facebook status or by how many followers you got on Instagram. You guys on IG, you're going to cut off. I'll turn you back on, inshallah.
But, but this is the problem. This is the problem. Is that we over sensationalize, over glamorize everything except the right things. All of the wrong things except the right things. We don't over glamorize and, you know, overly, you know, sensationalize the knowledge of the individual. It's all about the personality. Oh, this shake so-and-so or PhD doctor so-and-so. We love, you know, calling this person doctor and that person doctor. You know what I mean? Because it, you know, it makes us sound more intelligent that, you know, maybe we, you know, can lend, you know, we can borrow from, you know, from their title, or from their accolades. But what has the person actually done for Islam? What foundation has the person actually laid down so that generations of Muslims that come behind him can actually benefit from? But this is this is where we are in today's time. These are the things that are so important to us, man. These are the things that have that have so much importance. Meanwhile, you got, you know, mountains of knowledge like Imam Ahmed walking around and people don't even know what he looks like. But if you were to say, do you know the Musnad of Imam Ahmed? Everybody would know the Musnad of Imam Ahmed. But if you were to say there's Imam Ahmed over there, <laughs> He's a scholar. There he is right there. Nobody would even know who you're talking about. Anyway, a group from amongst the Munafiqun who went out with the Prophet Sallallahu which was their first time actually going out on a war expedition. They were responsible for the tragedy that we would come to know as the Qisatul Ifq, the story of the lie that was told on Aisha. They were the ones that were responsible for this whole entire incident. This was their first time going out on a war expedition with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Simply because they weren't, their hearts weren't really in it. They were only there because they thought the Muslims were going to be successful during the battle of Muraysiyah or the battle of Bani Mustalib. They thought the Muslims were going to be successful. So they went out only because they knew that the Muslims were probably going to win the battle and that they were going to you know, make a come up. Whatever war goods, the spoils of war that they were going to come across, they were going to get some of that. And that's why they went out. All right. So the Muslims, they succeeded in conquering Bani Mustalik. And uh, Juwadia, who her name, her real name was Birra. Birra. And Birra, the Prophet Sallallahu changed her name from Birra to Juwadia. All right. Her name was Birra bint Hadith ibn Abi Dira. All right, she was the daughter of Hadith ibn Abi Dirar, who was the chief of Bani Mustalik. All right, her real name was Birra, who the Prophet Sallallahu changed her name to Juwadia. All right, Juwadia, and I, I I explained to you guys before Juwadia ala wasn tasghir. It's it's in the Arabic language how we make something small, as I explained before. So, for example, if you have a book, you say kitabun, a book. If you want to say little book, you say kutaybun. All right. If you say, for example, um, uh, Umar, right? You say Umar. His name is Umar, and you want to make him little Umar. You say Umairun, Umair. Umair is just a small version of Umar. It's in the Arabic language. This is how Allah wasn't was called a wasn't tasghir. This is how you make something small. So the origin of Juwadia is Jadia. Jadia means a young girl. Young girl who has barely reached the age of puberty. It's Jadia. And a small Jadia would be Juwadia. All right. And the Prophet Wasallam, you know, changed her name from Birra to Juwadia. All right. That's where she got the name from. But her name was Birra bin to Hadith. All right. And why did the Prophet Wasallam change her name from Birra? What does what, what was wrong with having the name Birra? What does Birra mean that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would change her name? What does Birra mean? Does anyone know? Why did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam change her name? What was so bad about her name? Innocent? No. It's where innocent come from, barara. 
ascribing or righteousness to oneself. Yes, very good, Yasmin. Very good, Yasmin. Birra, birra, ba, ra, with a shedda on the ra, with a tamar buta afterwards. Birra, it means righteous. So the Prophet ﷺ changed her name from being righteous, right? Because you shouldn't call yourself righteous. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, فَلَا تُزَكُّوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Do not sanctify yourselves. That Allah knows better who fears him the most. Don't sanctify yourselves. All right? Don't sanctify yourself. Don't give your names, don't give yourselves names and titles that, you know, connote or denote self-righteousness. All right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-bir. Very good, uh, uh, Ali Sabir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-bir. The righteous, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who makes his servants righteous. All right, so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam changed her name to Juwadiyah. Little girl. <laughs> Little girl. To, you know, to humble yourself. All right? So the Muslims, they, they succeeded in conquering uh, Beni Mustanik. And Juwadiyah bin to Hadith, uh, who was only 25 years old at this time. Juwadiyah was 25 years old. She was among those who were captured. There were over a hundred people who were captured. Obviously on the battlefield, they were captured by the Muslims and they now become property of the Muslims. They belong to the Muslims. They are now property belonging to the Muslims. Which the Prophet Wasallam he had you know, ways of freeing them and things like that, allowing them to earn their freedom, pay for their freedom, things like that. This is one of the ways that the Muslims would you know, make money. If you were captured and you came from a wealthy family and your family wanted to pay for your ransom, they would give them that. It's called mukataba. There's a whole chapter in the books of fiqh called mukataba. And this is where the slave or the captive is given an opportunity to purchase their freedom. All right. It wasn't just, you know, perpetual servitude. As, as a matter of fact, the Prophet Wasallam encouraged Slave owners to give their servants an opportunity, their slaves an opportunity to, you know, buy their own freedom. And that and there's actually masail, fiqhia, there are actually fiqh issues that are connected to the chapter of mukataba, of a slave purchasing their own freedom. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam um, and the Muslims, they captured over a hundred of Bani Mustalaq. All right, their tribe. And uh, Juwadiyah fell into the possession of a companion by the name of Thabit ibn Qais. This is where I'm giving you the backstory because everything that happened with Aisha happened after all of this happened on their return back to Medina. So I got to give you the backstory because the Prophet ﷺ actually married Juwadiyah as we're getting ready to see. All right. So Juwadiyah's whole entire tribe, you know, were either killed or captured. Juwadiya herself ended up becoming a captive in the hands of one of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's companions by the name of Thabit ibn Qais. All right? Thabit ibn Qais, if you remember, I wonder for those of you who have a dhok al-hadithi, if you have a taste for hadith, do you remember Thabit ibn Qais? Does anyone remember? Where where you hear that name from before? We're trying to make connections here. Where did you hear Thabit ibn Qais? He was married to someone and an incident happened. He was married to a woman and an incident happened regarding him. This is how you make text-to-text -to -text connections. So you hear, you're reading a hadith, but you hear this name come up and you're like, ah, I'm... You're trying to place that name with an incident that happened with that name so that you can now make a connection. Is he the one whose son died? No. His adopted son of the Prophet Wasallam? No. Thabit ibn Qais. It's an incident regarding marriage. Let me see who remembers. It's an incident regarding marriage. Anybody who took my, my marriage course, you should know this name. If you took my marriage, how to get married and divorce in 10 weeks, if you took that course, you should know this name. He wanted to divorce his wife and the prophet told him to keep his family. Nope. 
Mm -mm. The one whose wife asked for a khula. Yes. Who is that? Khairia Garner. Yes. He's the one who his wife came to the Prophet Sallallahu What did she say? She said, Ya Rasulullah, inni la u'ibu ala thabit fi deenihi wa khuruqihi. That I do not have a problem with thabit as it relates to his deen and his character. But I cannot, I, I can't, she said, la utiquuhu bughdan. I can't stand to look at him. Right. And the Prophet Sallallahu asked her, well, can you give him back the garden that he gave you as a dowry? She said, I can give him the garden back and more. The Prophet said, no, just give him the garden back. He went to Thabit and he said, Thabit, iqbal al-hadiqa wa taliqha tatliqa. He said, accept your garden back from her and let her go from the marriage. This incident marks the first khula in Islam. This incident marks the first khula in Islam. Why am I making this connection? Not just so that you can understand who Thaba ibn Qais is, but to understand where we're going with this. Where we're going with this. The incident with Thaba marks the first khula in Islam. You guys should be aware of that hadith. When we're talking about a khula, and you go in any book of fiqh or any book of hadith, and you go to the chapter of the khula, you will find Thaba ibn, the hadith of Thaba ibn Qais. You can't miss it. You can't miss the hadith. It's, it's part of that, that whole chapter. This was the first incident regarding the khula. If you think about it, when she said, I can't stand to look at Thabit. Right? That means, that doesn't necessarily mean that he was unsightly. That doesn't necessarily mean that he was not handsome. It just means that he was, you know, for women who has a certain palate. Now, fast forward. We're on this incident here. Stay with me. Juadia falls into the, as a captive, in the hands of Thabit bin Uqais. Who is Juadia? Juadia is 25 years old. That's, we already know that about her. She's the daughter of the chief of Beni Mustalek, so she comes from the upper tiers of her environment, her society. She's wealthy. Her family's wealthy. She comes from, you know, one of the great tribes of that area. Her father was the chief of Beni Mustalek. So she comes from the higher levels. And now she's captive to Thabit Ibn Qais. You guys follow me? Where am I going with this? She's a captive to Thabit Ibn Qais. Where am I going with this? No, no, she's, you know, she's not. Well, no, he's, she's his concubine. He doesn't need to necessarily marry her. She's a captive in his, under his authority. Young, high status, petite, gorgeous, right? And she's looking at Thabit Ibn Qais like, nah, this ain't gonna work. She's out of his league, right? So what does she do? Juwadia, smart, she goes to the Prophet ﷺ. She looks and she sees he's the leader of the Muslims. Let me go to him. She goes to the Prophet ﷺ and she asks for mukataba. She asks for the Prophet ﷺ to free her, to pay her ransom. She's a right-hand possession to Thabit, but she's looking at Thabit like, nah, this ain't gonna work. She goes to the Prophet Sallallahu and she wants him to purchase her freedom. So, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala she's along this journey. All right? She's along this journey. So, let me give it to you in Aisha's own words. Hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari. Aisha is going to give you the whole narration how this story unfolds. So here's this beautiful, young, 25-year-old daughter of the chief of Beni Mustalak. She falls into the hands of a right-hand possession to Thabit bin Qais. She can't handle that. She goes to the Prophet ﷺ and asks the Prophet to pay her ransom. Aisha, radiallahu ta'ala, she gives us the whole narration. The beauty 
the beauty in Aisha narrating to us the Prophet Sallallahu how he married Juwadiyah. What does that tell you? If Aisha is giving us a whole narration about how her husband married this woman that we know today as Juwadiyah, radiyallahu anha, what does that tell you? What does that tell you about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? What does it tell you about this whole incident? What does that tell you about Aisha? Question. She has integrity. Go deeper. What does that tell you? That he was transparent with his wife. That the Prophet Sallallahu was not necessarily happy about it. As we're going to read the narration, Aisha wasn't, you know, over the top about it. She actually didn't like Juwadiyah. <laughs> she actually didn't like Juwadiyah, as she's going to mention herself. But it shows you the transparency of the Prophet Sallallahu He was a man. You understand? Picture the Prophet Sallallahu was Wasallam going behind his wife's back to marry a woman. This is not something that a man does. When a man is interested, as Aisha said, when she saw Juwadiyah, she knew that the moment the Prophet Sallallahu saw her, he was going to want to marry her. She knew he had a type. She knew that he had a taste. You understand? You, she knew her husband. And he was transparent because every marriage of the Prophet Sallallahu was documented. Is every marriage of the men in our communities documented? There's marriages that have taken place that nobody knows anything about except the individuals that was involved. Some of you have actually been a part of those marriages, unfortunately. Some of you have been game and down and a part of those marriages, unfortunately. My job is not to shame you to make you feel bad. I just want you to look at your actions in contrast to the actions of the Prophet Sallallahu in the early Muslim community and see the stark differences between the two. There are many marriages that have taken place in our communities that nobody knows anything about except the two people that was involved or the three people that was involved, the angels and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nobody. The community don't know nothing about it. Meanwhile, we have the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who all of his marriages were documented, not just documented, but narrated by his own wife. Aisha narrated this hadith. How do we know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam married Juwadiyah? His own wife, Aisha, narrated to us that he married Juwadiyah. That, that's a man for you. He ain't got to hide nothing. You understand I got to hide nothing. That is a man for you. Picture this man who his wife is narrating to the community, the ummah. You understand? That her husband married another wife. So listen to Aisha's words. This is in the hadith. Pay attention. So I've already painted to you what happened. Beni Mustalik was defeated. Over a hundred of their tribe their tribesmen were captured. Over a hundred of them captured. Juwadia included. Juwadia falls into the, uh, the right-hand possession of Thabit ibn Qais. Thabit ibn Qais, as we remember him from the previous hadith, that his wife asked for a khura. She did not want to be married to him. She could not take the way that he looked. Juwadia goes to the Prophet wasallam and asks him to purchase her freedom. Aisha is there witnessing the whole thing. She narrates to us in an authentic text everything that happened. Detail for detail how that whole situation went down. Aisha said, that when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam began to distribute the spoils of war and the, sir, the, the, the captives of war from Bani Mustalaq, he began, you go to him, you go to him, you belong to him, you are the possession of him. He began now distributing the captives of war to his companions. 
وقعت جويريا بنت حارث في سهم الثابل بن قيس جويريا he passed to uh, or he allowed Thabit to keep Juwaria. That was his captive. وكاتبت كاتبت هو على نفسها. Aisha said, and Juwaria, she wanted, she was trying to get her freedom purchase. She trying to finagle, wiggle her way out of this situation. <laughs> you understand? She's trying to get herself out of this situation. She's smart, she's young, and she knows how to use the resources that God gave her. The gift of gab. You got a, a closed mouth, don't get fed. So what does she do? She goes and tries to get the Prophet ﷺ to purchase a freedom. Using, obviously, the fact that she's the daughter of Hadith ibn Abi Dirar. Her father was the, the chief of Bani Mustalik. I'm her daughter, so perhaps he'll have some leniency on me. Aisha narrates, listen to what she says. This gets deep. وكانت امرأة حلوة ملاحة لا يراها أحد إلا أخذته بنفسه. Aisha said Juwariya was حلوة. And for those of you who speak Arabic, you know حلوة it means sweet, but it also means beautiful. When you bring a plate of food or you do something that is nice in front of an Arab and he says حلوة والله حلوة it's beautiful. Aisha said, كانت امرأة حلوة. حلوة. She was beautiful. ملاحة is where the word مليح comes from. مليح does not come from ملح. ملح means salt. ملاحة means جميل. It means beautiful. She said, كانت امرأة حلوة. ملاحة. She was beautiful. She was sweet and beautiful. This young 25-year-old. Aisha's looking at her. Aisha's 14 years old now. Keep in mind, 14, broaching 15. She's looking at Juwadia, this young 25-year-old. She's gorgeous. Gorgeous. She said, لا يراها أحد إلا أخذته بنفسي. She said, no man could lay eyes on Juwadia except that he would be awestruck. No man's eyes could land on Juwadia except that he would be overtaken by her beauty. This is Aisha narrating, you know, she's not hating on her. She's showing that she's beautiful. She's gorgeous, right? She's gorgeous. She said, no man lays eyes on Juwadia except that he will be overtaken by her beauty. She said, فَأَتَتْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ تَسْتَعِينُهُ فِي كِتَابَتِهَا She said, she came to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم asking for his help to purchase her freedom. This is Aisha watching the whole story play out. She's watching this woman wiggle her way out of this situation. Smart. This woman was smart. She said, so she came to the Prophet وسلم, seeking his assistance to purchase her freedom. Aisha said, lo and behold, yo, lo and behold, here this woman comes to the doorsteps of my home. Here this woman comes to the doorstep of my home. What is Aisha referring to? What is she talking about? What is Aisha talking about? She said, lo and behold, here this girl comes at, this, at the steps of my own house, my own door. Meaning, I see this woman coming. I see her. She, right, she coming for my husband. Right. Right, she said, lo and behold, for wallahi, she said, I swear by Allah, for wallahi, ma huwa illa an ra'aytaha, a ra'aytaha ala bab hujrati. He said, she said, lo and behold, here this woman come at the steps of my door. She said, fakarih to her. And I disliked her. I hated her. <laughs> she coming for my husband. And there's nothing I can do about it because... He's the messenger of Allah. He marries women. He going to do him regardless. There's nothing I can say to him to make him not interested in her. She's young. She's beautiful. She's the daughter of the chief of one of the tribes. 
You know what I mean? Like, there's nothing I can do. This is Aisha in a situation where she's handcuffed. It's nothing I can do. So she's narrating to us, but we can sift through her narration and we can see her frustration. We can feel her frustration. She said, for karit to her, and I hated her for this. I really dislike this woman, man. I really, because I see her coming. I see her a mile away. And I really dislike this chick, man. I really dislike her. She said, well, I to she said, and I knew that when she came to the Prophet Wasallam, he would see from her what I saw. Meaning, he would see her beauty. He would see exactly how beautiful she is. She said, I knew for Araftu minha ma'rait. I knew that he would see what I saw. She's she's beautiful. She's gorgeous. Some women, you guys got to learn how to stand in your discomfort. <laughs> you walk in somewhere and a beautiful woman walk by and you're looking at your husband like, I wish he would look in that direction. He's a, I mean, like, we do our best as men to try to look in the opposite direction. We do, we do our best to try to turn our attention, but what do you, what do you, what do you, what do you expect him to do? You have to learn how to appreciate that if the woman is beautiful, she's beautiful. But don't get in the car and say, I saw you looking over that one. That's what you like. She's ugly anyway. It's like, eh, stop it. Stop it. <laughs> stop it. <laughs> he might only have eyes for you, but there are, you know, there are other beautiful women out there. Knock it off, man. Stop it. <laughs> don't get in the car and try to destroy this woman image in the eyes of your husband because you want to be the only beautiful woman that he sees. And you know, beauty is beauty, you know. So Sister Esma said, we may look too. <laughs> beauty is beauty. <laughs> right. Just don't get caught. It's different on the other end. <laughs> There's double standards. It's different on the other end. Just don't get caught. Don't get entangled. <laughs> don't get in an entanglement, all right? <laughs> Don't get caught because some men don't take lightly to that. <laughs> All right. So, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala, she said, فَكَرِهْ to her. Right? She said, I hated her because I saw her coming. I saw her coming. She said, and I knew that if the Prophet sallallahu saw that he was going to see from her what I saw from her. All right? She said, فَدَّخَلَتْ عَلَيْهِ فَقَالَتْ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ أَنَا جُوَانِيَ بِنْتُ الْحَارِثِ بِنِ أَبِي الدِّرَارِ سَيِّدُ قَوْمِهِ وَقَدْ أَصَابَنِي مِنَ الْبَلَاءِ مَا لَمْ يَخْفَى عَلَيْكِ She said that, Aisha said that Juwaniya came up to the Prophet ﷺ and she said, she said, O Messenger of Allah, she said, my name is Juwaniya bintu Hadith. I am Juwaniya bintu Hadith and Hadith ibn, ibn Abi Dirar, he was the, the chief of Bani Mustalib. And I have been afflicted with what you can see right now, meaning I'm a captive. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so she, came, she continued, she said, Fujituka, asta'inuka ala kitabati. She said, so I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you um, in hopes that you could help me purchase my freedom. Right? She's beautiful. She's coming up to the Prophet Sallallahu asking him to help her purchase her freedom. Aisha sitting there looking at the whole situation like, this chick is full of you know what. You know exactly what you're coming up to him for because you know, you, you know you're know you using what you have to get what you want. You know what I mean? You Women learn that. Girls learn that at a very young age. You're using what you have to get what you want. And I don't mean that in terms of in a sexual way. I just means that some women have charm. Some women, some doors open for certain women just because how they look. Your whole entire life, your whole entire life, doors have been opening for you simply on the basis of how you look. Some women, you know, get certain doors open from them because of their charm. They have the, you know, they have to give the gab. They know how to talk. They know how to work the system. You guys are great at that. 
You guys can talk your way out of a, a ticket. Police pull me over. I'm getting a ticket. I, you know, I'm not wiggling my way out of that. Police pull you over as a woman. You can wiggle your way out of that ticket. You can wiggle your way pretty much out of anything. If you know how to use your voice, you know how to use your charm. You know how to use what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed you with that he did not bless us with. Some men have that as well. Some men know how to use their charm to get certain things, to get certain doors open for them. Some people have it and some people don't. Juadia, she had it. She went to the Prophet وسلم, She said, "Oh Messenger of Allah, I am the daughter. I am Juadia bin to Hadith, the daughter of Hadith ibn Abi Dirar, the chief of his people, Bani Mustalak." She said, "And I have been afflicted with, you know, my situation, as you can see. So please, I am seeking your assistance and perhaps securing my freedom." So the Prophet وسلم, being the man that he is, <laughs> here go men, right? This is man logic, 101. The Prophet وسلم, says to her, The Prophet وسلم, he said, Can I do you one better than that? <laughs> the Prophet وسلم, said, Can I do you one better than that? Can I give you a better offer than just buying your freedom? Can I give you one better? Can I do you one better? Qarat wa ma huwa ya Rasulullah. And so she says, well, what are you what what could be better? How how what could be better a better situation than you helping me to secure my freedom? And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said to her, "Aqdi kitabataki wa atazawwajaki." He said that I will pay your ransom, I will pay for your freedom and I and I'll marry you. How about that? Aisha's sitting there because she's narrating the hadith. So she obviously can hear the conversation. And I'm sure that Aisha's sitting there like, oh, my freaking God. <laughs> Aisha's sitting there looking at the whole situation unfold like, see, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> right. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right, man logic, <laughs> The Prophet ﷺ said, فَهَلَّكِ فِي خَيْرٍ مِنْ ذَلِكَ Can I do you one better than that? She said, what? He said, أَقْضِي كِتَابَتَكِ وَأَتَّزَوَّجَكِ He said, how about I pay your ransom and I marry you? Right? How about I pay your ransom and I marry you? So Juwadiya says, قَالَتْ نَعْمْ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ قَدْ فَعَلْتْ She said, yes, I'll take you up on that offer. Yes, absolutely. قالت وخرج الخبر إلى الناس أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم تزوج جوارية قالت فلقد أعتق بتجويجه إياها مئة أهل بيت بني مصطلق فما أعلم امرأة كانت أعظم بركة على قومها منها Aisha said, and it was only a short amount of time before it spread throughout the tribe, throughout the army that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم had indeed married جوارية it was only a matter of time before it spread throughout the army. Mind you, they're still in the in, 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 they're still on their return back. Somebody's at the door. They they they're still you know not back in Medina yet. They're still out on a journey. So he marries this woman. He marries Juwadia, and so Aisha says it was only a matter of time. <laughs> It's only a matter of time before the news spread that the Prophet Sallallahu married Juwadiya. Aisha said, listen to what she said. She said, وَلَقَدْ أَعْتَقَ بِتَزْوِيجِهِ إِيَّاهَ مِئَةَ أَهْلِ بَيْتٍ بَنِي مُسْتَلِقٍ The Prophet Sallallahu made Juwadiya's dowry. Here again, when we're talking about the dowry of a woman, we're talking about something of substance. Something that there will be a return on your investment. A return on your investment. Stop asking for $5,000 in a ring. Stop asking for $2,500 in a ring. What is it with this ring thing? Won't your husband just buy you a ring if you ask him for a ring? What is this deal with the ring? I don't understand like why Muslim women are so hell-bent on getting a, a ring for their dowry. Don't you know once you marry the man and you say, honey, you know, can we go to the store today and pick out a ring? I want a ring. And, and your husband, if he has it, he's going to go and, you know, He's going to go and he's going to buy your ring. 
You don't have to ask for a ring for a dowry. Ask for something that is of substance. Ask for him to pay your tuition to go back to school. Ask him to buy you a property, you know, a dilapidated building, an investment property that you can fix up and you can rent out so that you can have money coming into you, you know, even, even after it will endure beyond the, the, the marriage. But it's not our custom. It's not Islamic custom that Muslim women ask for rings. It's American custom. But the difference between Muslim women and non-Muslim women is that non-Muslim women have to get the ring as they're getting married. A Muslim woman can get a ring at any given time during your marriage. You can ask your husband for a ring. It doesn't have to be part of your dowry. What part of that don't you guys understand? I'm, I'm not following you. This tradition that you guys have created that has not proven to be, you know, and everybody's just following along with the trend. Everybody's just following the trend. Rather than saying, let me look at, you know, let me look at my, my religion. You know, sky's the limit as it relates to what you can ask for for a dollar. You can ask for a gold bar. You can ask for something that is an investment. That even if, if, if your, your marriage doesn't last, you have something that will continue. You will have something that will continue even after the marriage. You want $5,000, you're going to blow through that in a couple of months. You're going to, how, how long is $5,000 going to last you? How long is $10,000 going to last you? And you can keep going up with your thousands. You can ask for $20,000. How long is that going to last before you broke? I mean, I just, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. You can get a ring at any time during the course of your marriage. <laughs> Ask for something that is going to be of value. Something that is going to, you know, bring you a return on your investment. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked for, <laughs> the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked for, asked Juwadiyah, what does she want as a dowry? You know what Juwadiyah said she wanted as a dowry? She said, free my entire tribe. All the people that you captured, I'll make that my dowry. Free them and that will be my dowry. I won't ask you for nothing else. Don't you know that by Juwadiyah marrying the Prophet ﷺ and making her dowry the freedom of her people, she freed over a hundred individuals from her tribe that were captured just by marrying the Prophet ﷺ. Did you guys know that? Aisha said, فَمَا أَعْنَمُ إِمْرَأَةٍ كَانَتْ أَعْظَمُ بَرَكَةٍ عَلَى قَوْمِهَا مِنْهَا Aisha said, I don't know any woman, I don't know any woman who is more of a blessing to her people than Juwadiyah. I don't know any woman who was more of a blessing on her tribe on her people than Juwadiyah. Because all 100 plus individuals that were freed, all of them converted to Islam. All of them converted to Islam. And that is exactly why the Prophet Sallallahu freed them. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu made the offer to her. It was a win-win situation. The Prophet Sallallahu got to marry her. She was you know, obviously any woman that would, you know, work her way through the system to get to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to ask him to purchase her freedom. You could see that there's something in this woman. This is not your average woman. Right. It was a boss move. It was a boss move for a woman of 25 years old. What are our 25 year old girls out here doing now? You walking around with slippers with fur on them and spandex that's too small. This is what your average 25 year olds are doing. Can barely read an entire paragraph. You know what I mean? Like comprehension level is of a fourth and fifth grade student. This is what your 25 year olds are doing now. Meanwhile, this girl, this woman, 25 years old, made a huge move to marry this man who was, you know, the messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, obviously. She converts to Islam, makes her dowry the freedom of her entire tribe. Over a hundred people, over a hundred people, right, involved in entanglements, right, 25 years old. One entanglement after another, 25 years old. Meanwhile, this 25-year-old woman, 
You know what I mean? Is, is making boss moves. She freed her entire tribe. Right. I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not downing anybody. I'm just kind of making, you know, I'm just making these comparisons so that we step our game up, that we do better. We do better. It's, it's, it's ridiculous, man. Social media has really shown, for those of us who can see, how unintelligent we are as a nation, as, as Americans. People don't even know how to write. You on Facebook, you on Twitter, you like your sentences are run on. Your sentences don't have punctuation. You spell in there when it should be there. You know what I mean? Like you're mixing the theirs up. You know, like you, you, I mean, it's just really ridiculous. You're commenting on stuff that you didn't even read. Somebody put a post out. First thing we say is, I don't agree with this. Meanwhile, you never even read. Did you listen? Did you read? <laughs> Can you read? I mean, it's, it's really sad. It really is, man. I'm sitting back here, like, looking at some of the comments on my post. I'm just shaking my head like, you got to be kidding me. You, you don't even know how to comprehend. Make America comprehend again. Because we don't comprehend anything. We read, but without any comprehension. Comprehension matters. Context matters. <laughs> I put a post out. I said the class is going to be 6 p.m. X, y. Then the comment right underneath the post. Brother Eman, what time the class start? It's like it's right there in the post. It's right there in the post. Do you guys read? And if you read, do you comprehend? You have got to be kidding me. This has to be a sick joke, man. I, I'm I literally, man, I, I just really, and for Muslims, it's really sad, man. It's really sad. Because the first commandment given to the Prophet ﷺ was what? Read. Iqra. The first revelation, the first, the beginning, even before Al-Fatiha, before anything was revealed from the Quran, the first instruction given to Prophet Muhammad ﷺ in the Quran was Read. Iqra. Read. And we don't even do that, man. It's just it's really puzzling, honestly. Brothers and sisters, when you put posts out, man, autocorrect. Correct yourself. Go back and read your post again before you post it. Before you type something on somebody's page, Listen and under, try to understand what the person's perspective is before you comment so you don't make yourself look like an ass. Serious. Stop making yourself like, as the Arabs, they say, <laughs> Have some respect for your intellect, man. Have some respect for your intellect. It's, just, it's ridiculous, man. So lesson number one before we end today. Lesson number one. All right. This is lesson number one is learning to make sacrifices for Islam. Lesson number one, learning to align your personal preferences with the agenda of Islam. Lesson number one. Learning to align your personal preferences with the agenda of Islam. The Prophet ﷺ made Juwadiya an offer to marry her and to make her dowry the freedom of her entire tribe. Why? That was a personal preference. Yes, he wanted to be married to her, but his personal preference was aligned with the agenda of Islam. And that was for them to convert to Islam, which eventually they did. Every single one of them converted to Islam. Her whole entire tribe converted to Islam because of the move that the Prophet ﷺ made. You understand? This is lesson number one. Learning to align your personal preferences with the agenda of Islam. Your personal preferences. should You should learn how to align your personal preferences with the agenda of Islam. What does Islam say? What is the goal of Islam? 
And so when we pursue something, whether it is a job, whether it is somebody in marriage, whether it is to help someone, whether it's to, you know, be a part of some type of political movement, your personal preferences should be aligned with the agenda of Islam. You cannot separate from a political perspective. There is no such thing as a political perspective. You have your own personal take on it, but your personal take should be aligned with what your religion says. The Prophet Sallallahu yes, he wanted to marry uh, Juwadia, but even in his personal preference, he still married Juwadia with the hopes that her whole entire tribe would convert to Islam. Learning how to make sacrifices for the religion of Islam, that was a sacrifice. The Prophet Sallallahu didn't have to marry Juwadia, but the small sacrifice that he made to gain this huge return on his investment. So by marrying Juwadia, her entire tribe converted to Islam and she married the greatest man on earth. <laughs> she married the greatest man on earth. So that was one incident that happened as they are preparing to leave to go head back to Medina. So this was the first of those major incidents that took place before we get into the slander of Aisha. So now that we squared that away, that they went to battle with Beni Mustalik, they succeeded in conquering Beni Mustalik, they captured over a hundred of their tribesmen, including Juwadiyah, the daughter of Hadith ibn Abi Dirar, who was the chief of Beni Mustalik. She sees an opportunity and she goes after it. She's smart. She was smart. She knew exactly what she was doing. And Aisha disliked her. Aisha was in her feelings because there was nothing that Aisha could really do. Aisha said, I knew that the moment he saw from her what I saw, he was going to marry her. I knew it. I knew it. And sure enough, she came up to the Prophet Wasallam and she said, you know, um, I, I, want, I want you to, you know, purchase my freedom. And the Prophet Wasallam said, I can do you one better than that. How about I purchase your freedom and then I marry you? How about that? And how about, and, and Juwadiya said, okay, I'll accept that. Nam, kad fa'altu. I'll do it. I got it. I accept. But with the condition that you free my tribe. If I'm going to marry you, then you got to do one for me. You got to free my whole entire tribe. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Over a hundred people from her tribe. She, we're talking about her cousins. We're talking about uncles. We're talking about family members that were captives. And she's looking at all of her tribe and seeing that she has the opportunity to free them. She has the opportunity to use what she has to get what she wants. And she did it. She used what she had to get what she wanted. She said, yeah, I'll marry you, but you have to make my dowry the freedom of my people. And he freed every single one of them. They're, the tribesmen, they're looking at Juwadia like, damn, she just freed us. Right, she wasn't even thinking about herself. It wasn't about her. I mean, obviously she wanted to be, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his demeanor, he gives off like that. He's... He's that guy. You know what I mean? Like he's that man. It's undeniable. It's undeniable. Anybody, anytime you're in the presence of that type of energy, you know, women are naturally attracted to that type of energy. When a woman is around a man who's, you know, gives off that type of energy, she is naturally attracted to that. So I'm not going to say that she wasn't thinking about herself. Obviously, she was thinking about herself in that moment. But at the same token, she wasn't selfish. Very good. Very good. She wasn't selfish in that moment. It wasn't that she wasn't thinking about herself. She wasn't selfish in that moment. She got what she wanted and she was also able to squeeze a little bit more out of that situation by freeing her entire tribe. You understand? And so we have to learn the lesson from this is that we have to learn how to align our personal preferences with the agenda of Islam. Our personal preferences should be aligned with the agenda of Islam. And that requires sacrifice. How, how many sacrifices have we made for Islam? I, I want you guys to ask yourselves that question. Because the Prophet ﷺ did not have to marry her. 
He could have said, all right, I'll, I'll free, you know, I'll free you. But, you know, for the rest of your tribe, you know, they have to earn, you know, he didn't have to marry her. He already had wives. You know what I mean? He was already married to Aisha. He was already married to Soda. He was already married to Zainab. He was already married to Hafsa. He already had like five wives up to that point. He did not have to marry Juania at that point. He didn't have to marry her. But he married her because there was an agenda. There was a personal preference, but there was also an Islamic agenda. There's a personal preference and then there is an Islamic agenda. And that is that I can marry this woman if she, you know, give her a dowry and make the dowry the freeing of her, her whole tribe and perhaps her tribe will convert to Islam. So win-win for all of us. Now Quraysh can't use them anymore to help them because now we've isolated them. We've put Quraysh on ice by doing that because... In marrying Juwadi and freeing her tribe and them converting to Islam, they're no longer allies to Quraysh. They helped Quraysh during the Battle of Uhud. But now by marrying Juwadi and them converting to Islam, they're no longer allies to Quraysh. So we don't have to worry about them anymore. They're now Muslims. They're now a part of us. And they were outside of Medina. So now the Prophet Wasallam is developing allies outside of Medina. He's now making, you know, allegiances with different Arab tribes outside. You got to think about how the prophet sees this. He's a leader. He's a, he's a warrior. He's a soldier. He's a general. You understand? He's a general. So he has to think long term. How does this benefit my ummah? How does this benefit my community? He's a general. Strategic, Absolutely. Smart man, man. And, and it also shows you that, you know, polygyny for him was not just about amassing women and accumulating women and how many women he could have sex with. It was deeper than that. Because up to that point, he already had five wives up to that point. He was taking on another wife at that juncture was a was a burden. It was a responsibility, another responsibility to put on his shoulders. You understand? He didn't have to do that. He didn't have to take her on. That's another responsibility on his shoulders. He didn't have to do that. But he did it because in doing so, you know what I mean? He's now thinking long term. He's thinking in terms of the whole community, the ummah as a whole. So when you when a man is thinking about going into polygyny, his his thinking has to be broader than just another woman I can have sex with. Because Two, three months down the line, six months down the line, when the nostalgia wears off, when the, the dopamine wears off, the drugs wear off, and is now getting settled into everyday, rudimentary, day-to-day -day dealings as a husband and wife, you know, all of that, I can have sex with multiple women, all of that goes out the window because now you're in you're in family mode. You're in family mode. Your thinking has to be long range, has to be beyond just multiple women to have sex with to satisfy my desire you guys follow me all right and uh and so inshallah ta'ala we'll we'll continue so this is lesson number one learning how to align your personal preferences with the agenda of islam look at what what the agenda of islam is so you might have a personal preference but if your personal preference goes against the agenda of islam then you're essentially defeating your own purpose. You're essentially defeating your own purpose. Your agenda, your personal preference should be aligned with the agenda of Islam. And that requires for you to make a sacrifice. It's almost like Jabir, Jabir ibn Abdullah, who the Prophet wasallam stopped him one day and asked him, are you married? And Jabir said, yeah, I got married. And the Prophet asked him, did you marry a virgin or did you marry a matron? Did you marry a woman who had been married previously or did you marry a woman who was a virgin? Jabir, who was a young man at the time, he said, I married a matron. I married a woman who was married before. And the Prophet Mustaghrib was amazed and he asked him, why would you do that? Why would you, a young man who has never been married before, why would you marry a woman who was a matron who has been married before? He said, Why didn't you marry a virgin? 
So you guys can be both immature and irresponsible in your marriage, you know, until you guys have children and, you know, the dust settles and you get into family mode. Why didn't you marry a virgin? So you could play with her and she could play with you. And he said, because my father died and left behind daughters, meaning I have sisters. And I hated to marry a young, irresponsible, immature woman who would, who would be no benefit to me in, in helping me raise my sisters. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Ejit, good, good job. Good for you. You did a good job. You understand? It wasn't about his own personal preference. His personal preference was aligned with the overall goal. And that is that I got to get these girls on board. I have to marry. Obviously, he would want to marry a virgin, but he didn't have the luxury of doing that. You guys follow me. You have to learn how to align. Yes, I see someone had a question. What, what's your question, Amir? You had a question. So we'll stop here, inshallah, to Adafa today. Um, so that's lesson number one, and we'll continue to go through lessons after we finish, you know, but so much to pull out of that story with Aisha, but Aisha actually narrated the hadith. <laughs> Aisha narrated the hadith that should tell you a lot, you know, and so it was also during this trip that the envy and the enmity of the hypocrites exposed itself, you know, so... After this incident with Juwaria, the army packs up. You know, Beni Mustalat gets to stay where they are. They're Muslims. The Prophet Sallallahu obviously leaves some of the companions behind to teach them Islam, to educate them. The Prophet Sallallahu takes, you know, he even left Juwaria at that time. Juwaria did not go back with them to Medina immediately. All right. And the Prophet Sallallahu packed up, took his, you know, took the Sahaba and began heading towards Medina. All right. Heading back towards Medina. And so they get to a place and they stop and another incident happened. Um, and this was the second incident that happened right before we get to the slander of Aisha. All right. So we'll stop here inshallah ta'ala. You guys have been great. So here again, if you have Sahil Bukhari in English, or if you have it in Arabic, it's volume number 10 in Arabic, if you have it in Arabic, um, and if you have it in the English translation, you can go to volume number six, volume six in the English translation. Every household, every Islamic household should have Sahil Bukhari in it. Every Islamic household should have 10 volumes of Sahih al-Bukhari in it. You should have this book in your home. Although a lot, there, there's no explanation of the book, nonetheless, um, reading you know, the hadith and reading through them, sometimes you're going to come across stuff that you've already read before, that you've heard in a lecture, you know, but being able to read through it. Myself... And my children, sometimes we put this in the living room and then after the salat, we'll just open it up and we'll read a hadith and then we'll talk about it a little bit. And it opens, opens a door for discussion, opens a door for, you know, you to have a discussion with your children after the salat. Just, just, just some advice, inshallah ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. Wa sallallahu ala nabi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam and taslim kathira. Um, what I would like for you guys to do is to continue the conversation, you know what I mean? beyond what we discussed today. So if you have, you know, friends that attended the lecture today, if you have, you know, your Facebook pages or whatever the case may be, converse, talk amongst yourselves about what we discussed today. This is one of the ways that you help to keep the information fresh in your mind. And it also allows you to pay the cat on your knowledge by sharing it with other people. All right. But Yes, share notes, go through your notes, go through the conversation that Aisha had 
And uh, more importantly, make sure that you begin taking notes in your notebook, jotting down the lessons one by one, inshallah ta'ala. The next class will be on Wednesday. So that's Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Jazakumullahu khairan wa sallallahu ala nabiyyin Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira wa akhiru da'wana anil hamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.